Here we want to compare the mechanism for an uncatalyzed and catalyzed reaction so that we can discover how it is that the catalyst shows up in the rate law. We're going to look at the ester hydrolysis reaction, and the ester hydrolysis reaction is shown in this box. We have an ester group, that's that functionality, in the presence of water, which yields a carboxylic acid and a molecule, in this case of methanol. The overall process is governed by this rate coefficient, K on cat. So the mechanism of this involves nucleophile addition to a polarized pi bond, the carbonyl group. That ends up making a spitter ionic intermediate. It's spitter ionic, meaning that it has both positive and negative charges. The next step involves a proton transfer to move the positive charge that was on this protonated water molecule to the negatively charged oxygen. So we end up with this neutral species here. Each of these two steps the first one, the AD sub N step, and the proton transfer, those are fast relative to the next step. The next step is a very slow step compared to those first two. It's a beta elimination, and it involves the loss of that carbon-oxygen bond to kick out the leaving group, methoxide, and make this protonated ketone. That's the rate determining step, and that's the step we're going to use to write the rate expression. The last step involves the uh, proton transfer to make the neutral molecule of methanol and the carboxylic acid. As you can see in the rate law, it's a rate law that will derive on the next slide. It depends on the concentration of water and ester, and then it has this uh, overall uh, rate coefficient K on cat. Let's see where that comes about. We're going to focus on this step in order to write the rate law, and we're going to assume that everything up to that point is an equilibrium, and the steps in that equilibrium are fast relative to that rate determining step. Okay, so we're going to assume that we can write a, a fast equilibrium to explain the concentration of this key intermediate that is preceding the rate that is preceding the rate determining step. Here we go. We've basically described that process. We've ignored all those steps. We're just going to write two, t two things come together, ester and water. They come together under equilibrium conditions that are fast. They generate that key intermediate and then governed by a process that involves this unimolecular rate coefficient, K1 RDS. That's what governs the collapse of that tetrahedral intermediate to this ionic pair of methoxide and protonated carbonyl. So we can use that to write the rate expression. The rate expression is going to be K1 times the concentration of that key intermediate, but we're going to use our fast equilibrium to get rid of that species that we can't really measure the concentration of that intermediate. So if we write a normal equilibrium expression, KEQ, for that concentration of the tetrahedral intermediate, it's just going to be the concentration of the tetrahedral intermediate divided by everything that precedes it, everything that goes into it. That's the concentration of ester and concentration of water. That's in the denominator, and so we can take the denominator terms, multiply it by KEQ, and then we have an expression for our mystery component, the intermediate, that's the tetrahedral intermediate that we would like to replace in this rate law. And so now we can do that, and that's exactly how we can write the rate law that has the product of those two constants, the K1 for the rate determining step times that KEQ. That is in fact exactly what makes up that K on cat that we talked about when we talked about the overall rate for that ester hydrolysis reaction. The only small other detail I want to point out is in this box over to the lower left hand side. We're going to assume that the backward reaction is negligible, and the way we can get around that problem is, let's say we're dealing with the very first few percent of product formation. In the very first few percent of product formation, the amount of product is, is negligible, and so they don't, it doesn't contribute at all to the backward rate. We're going to use that just so that we can focus and simplify. Really, it's just a simplification of this problem, so we can focus only on the forward rate. It's a small detail. You don't really need to pay a lot of attention to it. Just in order to uh, to fully understand what is uh, what what it is that we mean by that initial rate. Okay, let's look at the catalyzed form. This is proton catalyzed. 
So you'll notice that a proton is appearing on both sides of the balanced equation. In other words, it doesn't contribute to the stoichiometry. We call this a specific acid catalyzed mechanism. We'll deal with this term specific in just uh, a webcast, the next webcast or two. But for now, let's see how proton enters in to the rate determining step. That's the bottom line, and that's what we want to demonstrate. How it is that this term enters into that rate law. Well, the mechanism looks like we're going to protonate the carbonyl. That's going to make a very much uh, stronger electrophile so that this ADN step is going to be faster. That's faster, but it's not the most important uh, rate that we speed up in this process. Um, there's going to be a proton transfer that takes place. We're going to move that proton from the water that was the nu nucleophile in that AD sub N step, and we're going to eventually move it over to this oxygen of the methanol group so that we can make an a better leaving group and, and accelerate the rate of that rate determining step. That rate determining step is still the beta elimination. That's this step here and that's what's going to be used in writing that rate law. Well after the beta elimination takes place we're going to regenerate that proton by loss of proton from the protonated carbonyl and that's how we recover the proton. We consumed it over here and we regenerated it over here and so it doesn't show up in the stoichiometry but as you'll see it does show up in the rate expression. We're going to once again assume that all of these steps that precede the rate determining step can be described as an equilibrium process and each of those steps are much faster than this step which is governing the overall rate. So we're going to take advantage of that same trick that we used last time to write the initial rate. Let's go ahead and do that on the next slide. Here we have three things that are involved in the equilibrium that precedes that protonated tetrahedral intermediate prior to the rate determining step. So we can just write an expression for that. So that allows us to write an initial rate that is the product of that rate coefficient, K1, for the rate determining step. And by the way, don't get confused, that's not the same rate coefficient for uh, the uncatalyzed reaction. It's different in the catalyzed reaction because this is going to be a much faster rate and so that's going to be a much larger rate coefficient. We're going to try to substitute this term here and we can do that by recognizing this equilibrium. And so we can just write an equilibrium expression and that equilibrium expression is the product or of the concentration of the uh, protonated tetrahedral intermediate divided by, in the denominator, we have the three terms ester, water, and proton. And so there you see three things come together to make that key intermediate, one of which is proton, so that's going to enter into this equilibrium constant. And now we can substitute this term into our rate law, and when we do that, we've got the product of KEQ times three terms, ester, water, and proton, and so we have again that KCAT as being the product of the equilibrium constant, which again is a different equilibrium constant than in the uncatalyzed reaction, as well as that rate coefficient that is also different. Key thing, bottom line, proton enters into the rate expression, does not enter into the stoichiometry, that's our definition of a catalyst.